Well, the story of David killing Goliath is a classic symbol of an underdog who defeats someone who's thought to be invincible. For example, when a sports team that's considered to be unbeatable is upset by a team that's not even regarded as competitive, we call that a David and Goliath outcome. So when the weak triumph over the strong, it's thought to be pretty amazing. But what about the original? Did the event described in the Bible between young David and the giant Goliath really happen? Many people doubt it. Now, it's not that it's so hard to believe in David. He's an exceptional young man with great courage and faith. Such young men do exist. But Goliath? The biblical book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, describes Goliath like this. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That's about nine and a half feet, or around three meters tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor or bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's something like 125 pounds or 56 kilograms. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed a hundred shekels. That's like 16 pounds, seven kilograms. Now, what are we to make of all that? Goliath would have been truly a giant, which is what the Bible calls him and others like him. Could such things, such beings have existed in remote antiquity? That's the question. Let's explore this a little bit. In the Bible, giants are divided into various clans or perhaps types. Let's begin with the general Nephilim. The Old Testament part of the Bible classifies giants as Nephilim due to their superhuman nature. In Numbers 13.33, the Israelite spies who had made a survey of Canaan spoke of being in close proximity to the Nephilim by saying that they felt like grasshoppers compared to them. I think that's talking about size. The word Nephilim may come from the Hebrew word nephal, meaning fallen. If that's the case, it would refer to their evil, fallen nature and perhaps even demonic origins. Genesis 6-4 says that the Nephilim existed both before and after the great flood of Noah. Their origins are recorded as being the union of sons of God with the daughters of men. Now, there are two main theories that attempt to explain this cryptic description. One theory is that the sons of God were godly men, males from the godly line of Seth who lived before the flood. And the daughters of men were the ungodly women from the wicked line of Cain. Some scholars think that the Nephilim were the product of that type of union. The other theory is that the sons of God were supernatural beings, possibly angelic beings, who mated with human women to produce superhuman offspring. And of course, the idea that angels could have sexual intercourse with human women and produce children is, well, highly controversial to say the least. A spectrum of scholarly opinion doubts that interpretation, citing Jesus' teaching in Luke 20, verse 34 through 36, that angels don't marry. On the other hand, those favoring the concept of angelic procreation counter by arguing that Jesus never said they couldn't produce offspring, but only that holy angels don't do such things. This point of view cites Jude 6, which speaks of angelic beings who stepped over the line in some kind of forbidden activity, possibly hinting at the procreation of children with humans. Now, this argument seems to be supported by the ancient mythologies of Egypt, Greece, Babylonia, Northern Europe, and the Americas, as well as many other cultures, which describe giants and demigods produced from the union of human women and divine or angelic beings. These beings are described as being mighty men of renown and sometimes giant in stature who did amazing and heroic deeds. But whatever these beings were, they probably formed the basis for at least some of the mythical figures which appear in many legends and folk tales of diverse cultures. The Bible also speaks of Anakim. As the Israelites came into possession of the ancient land of Palestine, they encountered the Anakim. Deuteronomy 1.28 records the Israelite spies as saying, We saw the Anakim there. 
The Israelites seem to have considered the Anakim as a clan or type of Nephilim. See Numbers 13.33. Deuteronomy 9 shows that Israel had heard that the Anakim were invincible because of their uncommon strength and height. The city of Hebron is said to have been the stronghold of the Anakim at that time. According to Joshua 11 and Joshua 14, when the invading Israelites under Joshua and Caleb conquered Hebron, the surviving Anakim left, presumably migrating southwest to the nearby Philistine country of Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza. Maybe that's where Goliath's forebears originated. The Rephaim, or the people of Rapha, seem to have been a race of the Nephilim living in the highlands of Palestine and Edom, as well as in the lands east of the Jordan River before the Israelites arrived. According to Joshua chapter 15, chapter 18 as well, the valley of Rephaim, located southwest of Jerusalem, was apparently inhabited by these giants before the Israelite conquest. And in the 20th century BC, a coalition of Mesopotamian armies led by King Cherdo Lamer defeated some of the Rephaim just before being defeated themselves by the patriarch Abraham. Four centuries later, the invading Israelites described King Og of Bashan as one of the last remnants of the Rephaim east of the Jordan. That's in Joshua 12 and Joshua 13. Deuteronomy 2 tells us that the Emim lived in Moab and that they were considered Rephaim and were as tall as the Anakim. Deuteronomy 2 says that a people called the Zamzumim lived in Ammon and that they were also tall like the Anakim. The Zanzumim were destroyed by the invading Ammonites sometime before the Israelite invasion. So here are some specific giants mentioned in the Bible. Deuteronomy 3.11 says that Og, king of Bashan, had an iron bed frame measuring nine cubits by four cubits. That's 13 and a half feet by six feet or four meters by two meters. You've heard of a king-sized bed. How about a giant-sized bed? I mentioned that Goliath of Gath stood six cubits in a span, nine and a half feet, nearly three meters tall. First Chronicles 11.23 records that a huge man standing five cubits tall, that's seven and a half feet or two and a quarter meters, was killed by the Israelite warrior Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. A Rephaite named Saf was killed by Sibekai the Hushite, according to 2 Samuel 21.18. The very next verse, verse 19, says that Elnathan, son of Jeri, Oregrim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. And of course, that seems to contradict 1 Samuel 17 that says that David killed him. However, the other Hebrew texts, such as the one in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5, referring to the same event, reads that El Nathan, son of Jair, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath. So maybe that's the answer. Another Rephaite, described as being huge and having six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, was killed at Gath by Jonathan, the son of King David's brother Shimea. The giant Ishbi Benab was killed by David's nephew Abishai in 2 Samuel 21. He had a spear whose bronze head weighed 300 shekels, that's about seven and a half pounds, three and a half kilograms. So again, what are we to make of all this? First, we must remember that the passages which record these giants refer to times in remote antiquity. King David, who appears to have been responsible for destroying the last survivors of the giants in Israel, lived around 1000 BC, fully 3000 years ago. So the people for whom these portions of the Bible were originally written and recorded lived in or nearer to those times, and they certainly knew what was being referred to. The ancient historian Josephus, who lived at the end of the first century, about a generation after Jesus, records that the skeletal remains of giants existed in his own times and could be seen. Here's what he said. There were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. 
The bones of these men are still shown to this very day. I think he mentioned that somewhere in the temple precincts they were on display. Now, of course, modern people have no experience with any such beings, and so we have difficulty believing that giant beings ever could have existed. Secondly, ours is an age in which skepticism is one of the supreme virtues. For some people, to even entertain the idea of giants having once really lived on the earth would amount to rejecting everything that they've been taught to believe, and it could result in losing the respect of their friends and colleagues. Thirdly, it's now probably impossible to know for certain how the giants originated or if they did. Both of the two main theories about the sons of God and the daughters of men have issues which the theories don't satisfactorily account for. The biblical record simply doesn't bother to explain the hows and whys to our inquiring minds. Here are some other facts to consider. There are isolated examples in various parts of the world of human skeletal remains whose size is similar to that of the giants recorded in the Bible. However, just as with any evidence of this kind, there's much dispute about the authenticity of the evidence, so some would call any such evidence a hoax, no matter how convincing. Then there's the issue of the widespread giant mythology in diverse parts of the world, which is a bit more difficult to explain away. Why do almost all ancient cultures speak in their legends and folklore of abnormally tall, strong, and wicked people? Greek pottery even depicts them artistically. Such a thing seems beyond mere coincidence. And of course, it could be argued that this is simply proof that in, in its infancy, the human race had a widespread belief in such beings, though they didn't exist. But on the other hand, the Bible's specificity of detail and description of these beings as abnormally large rather than mythically huge in size would point to the Bible record as being a little bit more than fable. There's something else to think about. I have in my personal library a book that includes facsimiles of dozens of newspaper articles dating from the late 1800s and early 1900s from communities across the United States. These articles speak of skeletons ranging from 7 to 12 feet in height discovered by various individuals, farmers plowing their fields, people exploring caves, teams excavating Native American mounds, etc. If these reports are hoaxes, then it must have been quite a fad in those days. Many years ago when I was on my honeymoon, my wife and I were visiting Virginia City, Nevada, and there was a shop there that advertised that you could come in and see the nine-foot Indian skeleton, which I did, and it was in a box with a glass top. The skeleton seemed to be about nine feet in length, um, so I saw it. I didn't know what to think about it, really didn't think much about it since then. But as time went by, I've wondered if maybe that was something real. Uh, there were legends of giants living in Nevada caves uh, by the Native Americans. Now, I don't know whether that was real or not, and I tried to go online and see if I could find it now, but there's absolutely no mention of it. I do know that I saw it, <laughs> but where it is now and how you could find it again, well, I have no idea. So is the Bible describing something real, or is it just fables about the giants? Well, the dominant narrative point of view today is that the Bible is unreliable and full of exaggerations. But I've found that the Bible can't be dismissed quite so easily. Archaeological and historical evidence seems to crop up with increasing regularity to show that when the Bible says something, it's based in fact, even if the facts are challenged or dismissed by the authorities, whoever they are anyway. One of the disturbing truths we have learned in this second decade of the 21st century is that the dominant narrative that we've been given all of our lives is sometimes just that, a narrative, a story used by people in power to shape our thinking in ways that serve their ends. And personally, I'd rather believe the Bible and serve the God who loves me than be controlled by a worldview that is dark, oppressive, and hopeless. This is Dr. Michael Bogart with Aspect Ministries 5-Minute Bible Guides. Yes, I know this one was way more than five minutes, 
but I trust it was worth it. By the way, I have a couple of books that you may be interested in, especially I wanted to feature this one. It's called The 45-Minute Bible, and it can be read in almost a single sitting. It gives you an overview of the Bible, and it has a companion DVD. And I know DVDs are kind of going out, but uh, there are some who still would like them. And of course, I, I do have a streaming version of this. This one really is 45 minutes in length. All right, see you next time.